Hello, welcome to today's webcast. I am Bruce Carton, the editor of Security Stocket, and we'll be hosting today's webcast. Today's webcast is, is really extraordinary. We take a deep dive on the question of whether cryptocurrency is the wave of the future or a giant Ponzi scheme. One of those, right? Um, let me put up, um, I'll, I'll just leave it like this. We'll leave it in this gallery mode. So we've got uh, both sides of the question covered by a terrific group of both experienced and really engaging panelists. Our guests today are Kelsey Hightower, Lee Reiners, Sandra Rowe, Anthony Scaramucci, and our moderator is John Stark. I'm going to turn over to John in just a minute. Uh, just a couple of real quick points. We're scheduled to go for about an hour. Uh, most importantly, we really welcome your questions. So your questions are anonymous. Don't hesitate to ask any question you may have. Uh, just click on the questions box and type your question right in. Um, our moderator today is John Reed Stark, who I've actually known for uh, more than about 30 years now since our days together at the SEC. Uh, he's now the president of John Reed Stark Consulting and has been doing incident response work and securities enforcement work for his whole career, starting with 11 years as the chief of the SEC's Office of Internet Enforcement, five years as the DC office head at Strauss Friedberg, um, and 20 years as an adjunct professor at both Georgetown and Duke Law Schools teaching cyber law and securities enforcement. He's written hundreds of articles on both topics and is a world-class cyber expert. John, welcome. I'm very pleased to turn it over to you. Bruce Carton, thank you, my brother. And welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I can't tell you how much it means that you all signed up for this to all of us. You are why we are here. I have a few questions in hand, but hope to ask your questions above all others. You are the most important part of this broadcast. I'm going to start with a few quick intros because this panel is so incredible. I can't believe we got these people together. I'm going to start with the, an incredibly remarkably pers remarkable person who has already transformed the way we all understand technology. His bio will tell you that Kelsey Hightower is a principal engineer at Google, working on Google's cloud platform and is a huge open source contributor and accomplished author and speaker. But if there ever was a reason to buy Google stock, Kelsey Hightower is it. I was not surprised when Kelsey's last Twitter space e event attracted over 80,000 users. Kelsey is a national treasure. His plain spoken manner, his disarming explanations, his extraordinary intellect, which is not at all limited to just technology, have already made the world a better place. And what I admire most about Kelsey is that whatever angle he takes, it's a benevolent one. In other words, the more successful Kelsey is, the more successful we all become. So thanks for being here, Kelsey. Next up is my Duke Law colleague, Lee Reiners. Of course, Lee's biography will tell you that he is executive director of the Glo Duke Global Capital Markets Center and that he's an associate. he was an associate at the Fed and also a U.S. Army communication specialist in Baghdad who writes frequently on FinTech and on the FinTech uh, FinReg blog and the FinReg pod. But what his bio doesn't say about Lee is just how extraordinary his FinTech scholarship is and what a rock star he is at Duke Law School. And I'm not surprised. His class was one of the first of its kind at any law school. The students line up for it and it's so cutting edge that other Duke Law professors sign up for it as well. So thanks for being here, Lee. Thank you. And next up is Sandra Rowe. She represents the entirety of the blockchain industry, and she's another rock star of sorts. Uh, Sandra Rowe, she's the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council, which brings together innovators and thought leaders from over 70 jurisdictions to support blockchain ideas and solutions. Her bio will tell you that she has more digital accolades and associations than anyone I have ever known. She is even one of the first to file cryptocurrency patent with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office related to derivatives and index products because her background is financial. But what Sandra's bio doesn't say, but what is evident from her globetrotting efforts to spread the gospel on blockchain is a truly humanitarian endgame in everything she's working for. It's hard not to appreciate and respect the lens through which Sandra views the word, world. And I'm sure you will all observe her unique perspective firsthand today. So thanks, Sandra, for being here. Thank you. Finally, last but not least, is one of the most dynamic crypto enthusiasts any of us will ever know, Anthony Scaramucci. Cut, Anthony, cut it out, John. <laughs> cut it out. Anthony okay. is, of course, the cut founder go back and managing Kelsey, partner. Go back to Kelsey and tell us how great he is. Cut it out, John. 
He's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge, a global alternative investment firm and founder and chairman of SALT, a global thought leadership forum and venture studio. Yes, he may be notoriously known for his quick stint with the Trump administration, but he is really best known as an extraordinarily- Are you, are you going to mention that I got fired, John? Because no. everybody knows. <laughs> you don't have to put that in the bio. You know what I mean? Are you going to mention, though, that we've known each other since we were 11 years old? Are you going to mention that? I wasn't going to mention that, but I, 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 I think right, people have ahead. figured that out. All right, keep going. Go ahead. He's an extraordinary successful entrepreneur and an extraordinary philanthropist, the author of five books and possessing one of the most innovative financial minds in the world today. What a lot of people don't know about Anthony is not just that he was one of the first in his family to graduate from college and the first to graduate from Harvard Law School, but to me... You know, having known Anthony for over 45 years, almost 50 years, and to anyone who gets to know him, he is one of the toughest and most fiercely loyal friends anyone could ever have. So thanks for being here, Anthony. Can't wait I'm to sorry. hear its dynamic. No, so you and I should sign off after that and let Sandra <laughs> handle this. You know what I mean? Because you're not going to get a better introduction than that, right? All right, go ahead. Keep going, John. Cheerio. All right, Anthony. Well, well, here it comes. Here's a question for everyone. All right. And, um, I want everybody to take this. Anthony, you can take it first. And uh, I know you're going to disagree with it. Now, yesterday, the president issued an executive order on crypto. And you spoke on CNBC with Lee. You said that this was a seminal moment in crypto history because the U.S. government was now officially accepting Bitcoin and crypto. Um, to me, it still remains quite a challenge to conjure up a single U.S. US societal benefit, social, economic or otherwise, of crypto and its untraceable financial transactions. Um, and I don't see many tasks that it improves or any. And I don't think it creates greater security. I don't think it disintermediates because you've got self-hosted wallets, you've got exchanges, you've got miners. Those are all involved in it. There's also liquidity risks, price volatility, cybersecurity vulnerabilities, criminal uses like ransomware, tax issues. Don't you think what's really going to happen is more regulation after the president's order? Like the fact that the Infrastru Infrastructure Act requires crypto exchanges to file 1099 tax reporting forms, and the SEC's uh, alternative trading system proposed rule will compel crypto exchanges to register as broker dealers. So does the executive order actually rebut this idea that investing in crypto is an investment strategy that could work and is not, as some critics have said, the greater fool theory, that is, you're, you're betting on a greater fool willing to buy it? So, Anthony, I'll hand it over to you, and then I can't wait to hear the rest of the panel as well. Well, I, you know, I, I definitely want to hear from the rest of the panel, so I'll be brief. Uh, I do think it was a seminal moment, John, because you have, by Mike Novogratz's estimate, we'll use his, there's probably 50 million Bitcoin owners in the U.S., 63 million owners of cryptocurrencies in the United States, and I think the genie is already out of the bottle. People have started to begin the process and the innovation associated with Web3. And so when you really dig into it and you understand it, and let's say we we're all going down an elevator quickly and I had to explain the blockchain to people, I would say this is a huge delayering mechanism. It's going to reduce the cost of transactions, financial and otherwise around the world. And if we can have a permissionless transaction between two people, that's fairly and propitiously regulated by the government. Of course, we want it regulated. Uh, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for Sandra, but I would welcome the regulation because that would get people more comfortable and it would allow for more adoption. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen whether people like it or don't like it. Of course, we can have the debate about whether or not it's a Ponzi scheme. But ultimately, I would encourage everybody to read Neil Ferguson's book, The Ascent of Money. Because what you'll find about money is that it's uh, always worth less than the goods and services that we're transacting with. And and I'll leave you with this, John, because I know you love this. OK, this is uh, I brought props for you. OK, because you know how much I love you. OK, so let's take a look at these. OK, you see these? These are Italian singles, John. You see that? You remember that from the neighborhood? You see those? Okay, now, these are made out of fabric, right? This is not paper. This is go Google it. OK, Kelsey works at Google, right? It's uh, <laughs> It's 75% cotton and it's 25% linen. Of course, Sandra, you know you're in America when there's a dead white male on the money, right? You know that. Everyone else has got the whole diversity, but here's us. And this is worthless, John. You know it's worthless and I know it's worthless, but we accept it as not being worthless 
because we trust it that we can give it to somebody else. And that's happening right now all over the world with cryptocurrency, whether you guys like it or not. And I'm done speaking because I want to let these other people speak. I, um, let's Well, let's go to Lee. Lee, you worked at the Fed. You are someone who believes in the dollar. Um, you know, Anthony's making some good points as far as perception is concerned. Those are important aspects of using crypto, of using any currency. What do you think? Yeah. Well, you know, if Anthony wants to uh, mail me those uh, hundred dollar bills, I'll, I'll take them. They're worth something to me there. Um, but, you know, he's right in the sense that money is fundamentally a social technology. Right? We've agree on what money is and we transact you know, with that money. Um, the question is, why do we believe it? Why do we, we trust it? And, you know, going back to like the origins of money, not to give everyone a history lesson here. Um, but, you know, before nation states, when we're all living in, in villages, um, you know, we didn't really need money because we knew one another. And so we kind of kept IOUs, right? So I know John, I know that I can trust John, so I can sell him something, let's just say a pair of shoes, and I know that he'll give me something of equivalent value at some point in the future, right? And maybe we actually write it out in an IOU, and then John can take that IOU and buy something from Anthony. Hopefully, Anthony knows me well enough by now, thinks I'm trustworthy, and he'll accept that IOU. But that whole system, you know, breaks down once people start traveling outside of their village, and you know, you don't know, you know, who this IOU is, is tied to, right? So enter the state, who you know historically has had a monopoly on money, and they're the common creditor because we all have to pay taxes to the state state sovereign money then becomes the freely circulating medium of exchange you know there's a, a lot of fascinating things about crypto w you know the main one is that it overcomes those geographic limitations that have hindered private money throughout history via the blockchain right and people refer to it as trustless trust because you can trust what's on the blockchain without having to trust any single individual or person or even know who's participating um, I mean, so that element is fascinating. I think when people hear that for the first time in history, we have the ability to transact value peer to peer without the need for an intermediary. It's a powerful concept and it really hooks a lot of people and gets them interested in, in this subject and it certainly did for me. But when you dig below the surface, there's just a lot of problems with cryptocurrency and blockchain in particular. It's not really better than existing payment mechanisms. The transaction speeds are like way too slow. So Visa and MasterCard network process transactions uh, at a much faster clip. Um, you know, we know that it's being used principally by bad actors. So outside of people that you know are just trading crypto, um, the primary use case is illicit activity because it's a lot easier to send $100 million in crypto than it is to send $100 million in cash. And the pseudonymity that crypto provides, of course, makes it uh, ideal. So it hasn't really lived up to its potential. And I'll end with this point. You know, one of the great ironies, and there's a lot when it comes to crypto, is that for a technology premised on disintermediation, the industry is filled with intermediaries. The way most people access crypto is via intermediaries, right? Principally exchanges. Um, you know, Anthony's a hedge fund investing in crypto. Hedge funds are essential intermediaries. Just look a few weeks ago, um, Citadel Securities received in an outside investment from Sequoia, prominent VC firm in Silicon Valley, as well as Paradigm, which is a you know, crypto VC firm. Um, Citadel previously hasn't been involved in crypto, right? They're, an inter they're the quintessential intermediary as well. They're a market maker, right? So that tells you now that they're getting into crypto. And look at Robinhood. Robinhood actually makes more payment for order flow from their crypto trades than they do for their securities trades, right? So the landscape is littered with intermediaries, but these new intermediaries aren't regulated like traditional intermediaries. So we haven't really improved upon anything and we can get into why are these assets worth something? What is the valuation methodology? Anthony and I talked a little bit about this last night uh, on CNBC, but there really is no methodology. There's no cash flow. There's no comparables. So you just are sort of picking things. You might as well be pointing to you know the astrological charts for your your price thesis here, um, and you know you are relying on the greater fool theory that you can sell your crypto to someone else at a higher price in the future, regardless of whatever economic benefits there are, and that structure will come to an end at some point. It's just a matter of when. 
Uh, okay, I'm going to turn to Sandra now because, and then let Kelsey, I don't know where Kelsey stands on this, but I certainly know where Sandra does. So how do you respond to those? Those are arguments you see on Twitter. You see them all over the place, and I'm sure you can address them. And I'm really interested in hearing you. So go ahead, Sandra. Yeah, sure. So first of all, there's a lot there. So I'm just <laughs> going to take a couple of these verticals. One is around the executive order. First of all, I am aligned with Anthony when he says it's seminal. I use the word watershed, doesn't matter what word you use. It's a major moment. The US has come out officially from the highest office saying that this is a priority. And let's contextualize this. We've got a war going on on the other side of the world. We've got COVID, we've got hyperinflation on the horizon and the government has decided now is the time to say this is top priority. It means something. And it's not just recognition of cryptocurrencies, by the way, I'm gonna take the lens out a bit wider, it is actually, they say, digital assets. And that is literally a theme that we need to keep in mind, which is everything is digitizing. And in the last couple of years, everything has accelerated in the digital world. So we have two worlds today, one where the digital economy is booming and growing, and one where the real world, let's, let's face it, restaurants, um, hotels, you know, the, the real world stuff, as you may want to call it, um, is actually suffering and, and, and really have taken a few steps back. And so we have these very different worlds that are now coming out of COVID, hopefully. And I think what we need to think about in terms of what's come out of the executive order is it is a top priority because we need to actually help support innovation. And that includes cryptocurrencies as well as digitizing of, digi of assets in general as well as blockchain technology. So that's one. Number two, I appreciate the view and the lens that somehow it's not useful in the US. I would love to go through a whole other hour talking about how that's not true. And there are many, many use cases that actually show that it's it's very helpful. Well, what's and, your favorite one? What's your favorite use case? Sorry to interrupt. But, but what I'd like to really focus on is the rest of the world, because I often find the argument comes from a very US Western centric lens. And if you go to the other parts of the world, especially when there are crises going on, let's say Afghanistan, let's say different parts of, you know, worlds where the currency, the local currency is not doing well, um, often it's a lifeline. Often it is a, another mechanism whereby people can try and attempt to preserve some of their assets. And so I think looking at that from that lens is also important when we're looking at overall cryptocurrency arguments. And when I look at, for example, you just asked me, what is an example that seems, you know, really promising in the US? Well, here are a couple of different things. I think during COVID, we saw some pretty fundamental issues with the government right now, which is they're still using COBOL software down at local and state levels, as well as at the federal level, um, software that's just way outdated. They have payment systems that don't work. People aren't getting funds because addresses are wrong. It goes through the mail. I mean, we are talking about what, 30, 40 year old stuff that should really be upgraded. So whether it's blockchain technology or not, these conversations are being had. And, and I'm the first to tell you, blockchain does not solve all things. However, it should be looked at as a technology tool alongside all the others and a judgment call made whether it solves that problem or not. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. Kelsey, you're probably, again, one of the, the most famous technologists that I know and you're knee deep in all of this. Are, are these representations about the technology accurate? Is it secure? Is it private? Does it pose, prob does it pose problems? Does it create solutions? Um, what, what are your thoughts on the whole thing? Well, I mean, from, from a technology, technology perspective, perspective, you know, if you're, you're an engineer, engineer um, you build technology, technology to solve some, some problem. problem. And, and typically, typically there's a plan or there's a reason why you've even built, built that technology in the first place. And so when we look at blockchains, effectively a database here, so let's get pragmatic for a second. We're talking about a database, right? The, the hype levels, you would think that Oracle will be worth $100 trillion because of where it's used throughout the entire globe for healthcare, payments, the whole nine. And so when we think about this from a technology perspective, to watch the mania several levels above, most technologists with hands-on keyboards the people who participate in these open source communities, they're not quite sure what you're talking about. They're like, wow, I think you all found a new way to make money and you're making up a lot of these kind of use cases or it's surprising to me of how many are so humanitarian, right? 10 years ago, 
Where were you for all the unbanked people in the United States? There was ways to solve that before blockchain. Blockchain shouldn't be the thing that gave you permission to care about people. So a lot of us are a little bit um, unsure of the authenticity of these claims that everyone all of a sudden cares about everyone's ability to participate in the financial system. Now think about it. What do you need to actually participate in, let's say, Bitcoin, for example? You actually need like a mobile device or a computer of some sort. That isn't the cheapest form to get involved in any financial system. Then how do you acquire cryptocurrencies? Most exchanges want 3% off top. They want 3% to exit. And then the fees. I used to work in financial services. I remember the time the government put a clamp down on how hard you could charge someone for overdraft fees and debit card fees. And that disrupted the whole industry when you start to take the money out of it. So if you still have fees measured in tens or $30, most people are like, I don't even have that much money to spend on the thing I'm buying. So I think a lot of people are just suspicious of all that worthless money. I think that Anthony held up. When we hear that as a common set of people, think about all the time and energy normal people trade for worthless paper. That means they're essentially worthless. My time is worthless. And the only way I can survive is by using the new system that you just made up, right? A couple of years ago, you said, hey, here's a new system. This is now the new store of value. Forget what we told you 100 years prior. Your thing is now worthless. And you should give us your worthless thing for this other thing that is actually worth something, but you can't really spend it yet. And so as a technologist, we typically don't build things that actually don't have real world utilities for the initial design purpose. So for me, it feels like a lot like the legalization of marijuana. It was a bad thing until a certain group learned how to profit from it. And everyone celebrated the regulations around marijuana because they figured they could actually get their cut finally. And so a lot of this cryptocurrency movement to me feels motivated by the ability to extract fees as middlemen, not this idea that people will have a peer-to-peer -peer system that won't need the existing system. So as a technologist, that's where I stand. I think the technology was built and designed to be this true peer-to-peer -peer situation, but you don't make money in that system. And so therefore, I don't think people are applauding things until we set up shop with the exchanges. And now I think people are applauding the regulation because it etches their position in this ecosystem, even though it wasn't the original design. Yeah. So let me, let me, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to that, Sandra, but let me interject because you talked about blockchain. And it's difficult for me as a non technologist when I get down the vortex of whether blockchain works or not. Um, and I found a technologist that I really love reading. Her name is Molly White. She's one of the more revered, I think, and respected technologists. She writes and speaks about Bitcoin, blockchain. She has three resources I've read, an article about blockchain entitled, It's Not Still the Early Days. She has a blog entitled, Web3 is Just Going Great, where she chronicles many, many problems associated with it, including fraud and chicanery beyond measure since my 20 years at the SEC. And she also gave a lecture a few days ago at Stanford entitled, Abuse on the Blockchain. In her article, she says, cryptocurrency exchanges have been around for ages. Stable coins and NFTs have been around since 2014. One of the first well-known decentralized autonomous organizations and DAOs was created in 2016. Smart track contracts became popular in 2017. So this raises the question, how long can it possibly be early days? How long do we wait before someone comes up with an actual application of blockchain technologies that isn't a transparent attempt to retroactively justify a technology that is inefficient? How much pollution? One of the questions came in that talked about the pollution and the wasted energy. Must we justify pumping into our atmosphere while we wait to get out of the early days of proof of work blockchain? How many people have to be scammed for all their worth before people will stop talking about the beginning and building safeguards? How long must the lay person who are so eagerly hustled into blockchain based projects? And that's a sad I mean, truth. I mean, you're like the Howard Cosell of moderators. Though. I mean, I, mean, I tell you were like a neutral moderator. OK, keep going. Go well, no, no, I'm bringing in Molly's point because it's compelling to me. I mean, are her concerns, which are shared by many other technologists, are they misguided? You know, is she just feels like she speaks for almost an hour in the Stanford lecture specifically cataloging just how catastrophic the data privacy and data security vulnerabilities of blockchain really are. And she emphasizes it's not acceptable to say that you'll just wait and address those in the future. 
So, so John, one thing I would say as like as a technologist and from a pragmatic perspective, it's a database. The reason why we're talking about blockchain still in 2022 is because we haven't found that right application. How many people talk about Oracle instead of an e-commerce website where you actually do things? We don't talk about the database that runs Disneyland because we're focused on the value that Disneyland creates. You go there to ride rides, not enter into a database that you actually bought a ticket to the theme park. And so until you actually have something that's more worth talking about than the underlying technology, you will keep trying to find a use case for the underlying technology. We don't talk about phones. We talk about what we do with smartphones. And so I think we're just at the phase where, yes, we've made this monetary system. I do think this is a, an experiment, experiment to create a new monetary system, if you will, all 9,000 of these cryptocurrencies. But that is boring to the most people. Most people in the world will interact with that system through a web browser, through a mobile device, through a wallet app, and the blockchain won't be the most interesting implementation detail there. Most people would say, look, if you allow me to transact with other people in the world, how is that different than Cash App? I get the answer. It's that we will allow more people to participate. But remember, that gets boring really quickly. If that's all you have, then there is nothing to talk about going forward. We just now have a better payment system. End of story. So I think there's the bit of the speculation, which is giving all of this excitement and attention. Without the speculation, are we still talking about this in 2022? Go ahead, Sandra or Anthony or both of you. Go ahead, Sandra. So uh, there's just so many different subtopics. I'm going to just try to focus on a couple. Uh, number one, when we're talking about blockchain technology, let's remember there are many different blockchains that are out there. So I don't know what um, the technologist that you were referencing is alluding to, but not every layer one is the same. So first of all, which blockchain are you talking about? And then secondly, the advances that are going on in blockchain itself is an ongoing process. We're talking about infrastructure technology here. And whether you agree or not, whether a particular blockchain is good or fit for purpose, that's a separate debate. But the point being is there is a proliferation of these things. They're testing out different ways. Some of them are really fast. Some of them are, are actually for something else. They all have different purposes and you need to get into the weeds to actually understand whether some blockchain is, you know, fit for purpose or not. So that's number one. Number two, I, I hear this argument a lot about how this has all been created because of speculation. I went through the financial crisis in 08 and 09. And if people are wondering why this all came about then, I think there's a very specific reason. We were at the edge of, of pretty much the entire financial system going down. And anyone who was a banker then on a trading floor, it was terrifying. I was sitting at Morgan Stanley in London. We worked night and day to try to figure out how we were going to mark to market stuff. Information was all over the place. Long story short, it is not a good system even today to understand where global real-time risk is. You ask any asset manager, they will tell you they couldn't tell you what the real-time risk right now of their entire portfolios. And to me, some of the push that we've given because of crypto and blockchain is to actually make the financial services system today better. Anthony, I know you get into the weeds on these things, as um, Sandra said, I'm so I'm interested in your opinion. I'm well, I'm going to I'm going to answer it a little bit with a rhetorical question, because I think that you guys obviously don't like it. And I understand that. But the genie is already out of the bottle, John. So so you've got I don't know. Let's go over the math. OK, 140 million Bitcoin owners, 240 million wallets, according to Glassnode. Uh, I think Coinbase's last uh, quarterly uh report, I think it was 80 or 90 million accounts at Coinbase. I'm going to give a rough number so I don't remember the exact number. And so what are you and Molly White, what are you guys suggesting, Lee, suggesting that, okay, so you'll you'll disallow all of that and you guys will have an edict, a centralized edict that says we don't like this and it's so therefore it's gone? Or, or are you going to let the free marketplace of ideas and the intellectual community of capitalism resolve this over time? I guess that's my question. And so the thing I would remind everybody of, uh, and my family's certainly a great beneficiary of this, is the greatest decentralized organization that's ever existed is the US government. Uh, the great wisdom of the founders of this government set it up in a way that diffused the power at the top. 
And what we find is that centralized things are very wobbly and very fragile and things that are decentralized create a lot of freedom and a lot of opportunity. So I'm not going to argue with Lee about ransomware. I'm certain that there's things out there. Ransomware is pernicious. I wish there wasn't the same way I wish there weren't bank robbers and the same way I wish there weren't illegal activity in the Bernie Madoff, Sandra, in our society. Um, But what I am going to say as an American, that I would like the free marketplace of ideas, entrepreneurship, the flow of venture capital and other capital uh, to make these decisions for me. Because, you know, Henry Ford said, hey, man, if I listen to my customers, they wanted faster horses. Okay, Steve Jobs said nobody wanted this. I had to invent this. And so there's a process of invention that's going on right now. Uh, Some of it is probably flawed. Molly White is probably right about some of the flaws. But why not let it go and let's see where it ends? Unless you're telling me tonight you and Joe Biden and Lee, okay, and your henchmen (laughs) are going to round up all the Bitcoin and Coinbase accounts. If you guys are going to go do that, okay, go ahead. Good luck with that. But America's not designed like that. No, well, Joe, that's a good point, Anthony, and it's compelling. But Lee, I, yeah, Lee, I want to hear your point because what what Anthony might be arguing, is saying, is that even the regulators shouldn't come in because, like I said, the Infrastructure is, Act is now defining what an exchange is in terms of Form 1099s. Um, Chair SEC Chair Gensler last week said, "Hey, essentially, if you're an exchange and you're operating and selling digital currency, you should be registered if you're operating in the U.S." Yeah. So I don't know if, if the Biden executive order is going to put a stop to that. I think Chair Gensler is going to lean in. And I don't, well, I don't know whether that'll be a good thing. But go ahead, Lee. It's no, well, I, I'll be, before you talk, because I want to interrupt him for a second. Before you talk, yeah. I'm not for anti-regulation. I yeah. want them to register. I want, I want there to be regulation. And I want there to be consumer safety. And I, I'm for layers of regulation. But I'm not for over-regulation. Yeah. Go ahead, Lee. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I was actually going to make that point for you, Anthony, so I'm glad you you clarify it. You know, Gary Gensler has also articulated this point as well, that if the crypto sector is going to be around long term, it actually needs to embrace some form of regulation. Now, we can, you know, debate, you know, the structure and how rigorous that should be. But he likes to point out correctly to the growth of our capital markets in the wake of the Great Depression, right? When we passed the securities law, we created the SEC, we created deposit insurance, and that ushered in an era of unprecedented economic growth. And it's the reason why the US has the deepest, most liquid capital markets in the world. It's the reason why it's easier if you're an entrepreneur or small business to raise capital in the US than anywhere else, because investors know that they can trust what they're putting their money into, that there's a degree of regulation, that they have recourse to the courts. And because of that, you know, we're able to have this just powerful economic engine. So, you know, I agree that, you know, with, with Gensler's sentiment, that there needs to be more regulation around crypto. And we can talk about, you know, my thoughts around what specifically should change. If this is going to attract more people, I mean, I think that that fact sheet that accompanied the executive order actually cited, uh, I think it's like 16 percent of Americans have crypto. You know, if, if you want to move that needle, you know, to, you know, let's just say half, I think people are going to want some more regulation that they know that they can trust their money will be safe and secure. Um, you know, to Anthony's point around let the free market decide, like, listen, I am a capitalist. I support, you know, free markets. The problem with crypto is that there are negative externalities that are created and the free market doesn't address negative externalities, right? That's one of the fundamental functions of government. And we see this most clearly with climate change, right? Where emitters are not paying the cost. They're not internalizing the cost of their emissions. And so when that happens, the government needs to impose and force them to to internalize that cost. So what are the negative externalities when it comes to crypto? Well, you know, sticking on the theme of the environment, we know proof of work coins are just incredibly energy intensive. Most of that energy is coming from fossil fuel sources. So there's that aspect of it. Um, Two, there's a systemic risk element to this um, as well. So a problem, you know, if crypto were to go to zero tomorrow, Bitcoin or Ether, it wouldn't just, you know, stay within the crypto sector. You know, we have new connections forming by the day 
with the traditional financial sector so that problems in crypto will spread. I know one of the things Anthony is focused on is a, a you know Bitcoin ETF, right? We have you know cash settled Bitcoin futures contracts, a CFTC regulated instrument that the largest you know asset managers in the world are allowing their clients to trade. These are traded at the CME, the largest futures exchange in the world. These are centrally cleared, right? Um, and that was one of the complaints when these things were introduced from some of the asset managers is that they wanted a separate default fund for the clearinghouse of, of these uh, these products. Um, and there, are, and then obviously there's the economic and national security risks. So ransomware would not be a problem uh, that it is now absent cryptocurrency. Ransomware wasn't front page news prior to, to cryptocurrency. Um, and there's, a, you know, I can rattle through the stats, but, you know, this is a real issue. I wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed in the wake of the colonial pipeline hack calling out crypto's use in ransomware. And, you know, of course, and then I said, you know, we should ban crypto. And, you know, I got the usual vitriolic responses from the crypto <laughs> sector. But one of the things that really struck me was the number of messages I received from small businesses across this country who had almost lost everything due to a ransomware attack. And I know you live this daily, John. Yeah. So for every colonial pipeline hack that we read about, every JBS ransomware attack that we read about, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of small businesses, municipalities, healthcare hospitals. systems, yeah. hospitals that are victimized by ransomware, all because of crypto that we don't hear about. And then the national security implications. We know that crypto is being used to undermine sanctions in Iran, in North Korea. I'm not making this up. The UN has reported on this. Treasury has reported on this. And of course, now it's likely that it'll be used on a limited scale in Russia. I'm not claiming that the you know Russian economy can run on crypto, but certainly I think for some sanctioned individuals, they will find crypto to be a useful place to store their assets for the time being. We also know that ransomware proceeds primarily flow through Russia and that the only two cryptocurrency exchanges to be sanctioned by the Treasury Department are based in Russia. So when you look at it from a whole, those are some pretty significant negative externalities. Those are some very serious costs that society has to bear, not the crypto sector. They're not paying those costs right now. And the question that I repeatedly ask is, what is the commensurate benefit that we're getting in return? And to me, it's pretty clear when you step back that the costs vastly outweigh those benefits. And so that's where government needs to step in. I don't think it's going to be banned. Obviously, the executive order uh, signaled that very clearly. It is here to stay. And so the question is, what do we do to harness the, the benefits to the extent there are any? And I question that fundamental premise, but the executive order seems to think that there are benefits while controlling for the risk. So we're entering into this new era where we all recognize crypto sticking around. Right. What do we do next? And that will be the process that's going to play out over the next few months, because this executive order calls for at least 10 separate reports on all facets of the crypto market. Right. And that will kind of be the roadmap that agencies follow. And I'm sure you know, Sandra and her organization are going to be you know, lobbying aggressively these agencies to make sure that it comes out the way they want it to. And you know, one of my frustrations is that there's no countervailing force you know, kind of pushing back on the crypto sector, right? All the money, all the interest, all the passion is on one side. And until this thing blows up, there's not gonna be any organized interest groups kind of pushing back against some of these baseless claims. Let me let me bring in Kelsey, and then Sandra, then I, I want to give you a chance to respond to Anthony too. Kelsey, I've heard you talk about the gamification of investing and how, it, it, you know, all these ideas, traditional ideas from someone like me, uh, Lee is right, I get called every name in the book, you know, threatened by tons of people. And uh, the la last name I got called yesterday was having a really, really bad, a really fiat resume. My resume was a fiat resume. And I get it. I'm old school. You need to do due diligence before you invest, all these things. Kelsey, am I completely out of date? Tell me tell me what concerns you have, if any, about this. That you're completely out of date. You just have to that. You are How do you have gray hair, incoming. John? And Anthony's got jet black hair. And you guys Because Anthony's so always been more handsome. First of all, this is not jet black. This is Latin American dictator brown. Uh, <laughs> I was using Cuban leader black. It looked like shit on television. So I had to lighten it up a little bit. It's, all right. It's not jet black. But you are completely out of date. But go ahead. I, I admit that. I admit it. Kelsey. I mean, believe like a total dinosaur, but go ahead. What is, <laughs> Kelsey, what, what is the answer to this gamification? Should we encourage it or is it here to, is that here to stay? And is that a problem? All the things that Lee mentioned, 
the, the investor doesn't care about, right? All they care about is just, hey, I can invest in something and it'll go up. What do you think? Wait, your volume's off. Kelsey, your volume's off. Kelsey, your volume's off, yeah. Hey, Kelsey, yeah. keep people your volume off. You're going to say something mean about the industry. <laughs> no, no, no. I say anything mean. I think people want to trade anything. The, at this point of society, people want to trade anything. Baseball cards, crypto tokens. That The cat is out of the bag with this, right? I think work is being devalued that humans do. Human beings trade their time for work and still can't afford to survive in many parts of the world. And so our advice to them is, too bad. You need to take what you work for and gamble it. Pick one. Stocks, gold, crypto coins, baseball cards. Your only means of survival at this point, given the high inflation, is to pick the right investment so you can survive. To me, that is unfortunate. I think that's a bit backwards. I don't think we should be pushing people into this. And since we've pushed so many people into this, John, to answer your question, we are forcing them to invest out of survival, not just to get ahead, not just to you know, take their money and do something with it. No, it's now becoming the only way to make it. And so for people like me, why do I even care about crypto? I actually wish I didn't even have to talk about it or even think about it. I don't buy gold, I don't buy silver, and I don't gamble at Vegas. I don't buy lottery tickets. I do buy stocks, that's my preference. But why do people even care? I think for us, we're looking for what is the crypto roadmap? There are some people on extreme ends that see Bitcoin replacing all fiat currencies at some point in time in the future. Now, what the probability of that is, I'm not sure, but it's something to pay attention to. If you have worked for the last 60 years and all you have is fiat money and you rely on something like Social Security and someone tells you that you know, you're past your earning years, that someone's going to replace your money and it's going to go to zero. And this group actually will benefit more when that happens. Right. So you watch all the heavyweights come in and champion this thing and applaud every turn that adoption grows. And the extreme opinion there is your fiat goes to zero. Your bank account is wiped out and you're too old to jump back in the game to earn this new currency that people probably don't want to part ways with because it keeps going up in value because of its scarcity. And so for a lot of people, if, if that's one of the roadmaps and a lot of crypto people say, well, Bitcoin will be whatever it's going to be, it's like, no, we need to be clear. If you're going to challenge all currency, then all the people who are not in or can't afford to get in or all the unborn people that are going to get in way too late, then I think you're going to see an uprising of people that say, I can't play your game. You already have billions of dollars of the current money. You have a head start to buy this limited to supply and do what you want with it. I'm going to be left out in the cold. So a lot of us just want clarity. What is the roadmap? And the last thing I'll say here is, if the roadmap is literally just a way to democratize the financial system for everyone in the world, if that's truly what we're talking about, then we know what happens to technology that does that over time. The price goes down, right? If we're really talking about technology, you will see real competition. And for most people, they'll still be choosing between Visa, MasterCard, Apple Pay, Cash App, because those will all be the front ends to this system. You won't even talk about Bitcoin because it's the layer one. We already know that most people will never be able to afford to transact at layer ones on most blockchains. And you will just use the most friendly customer thing that you can get your hands on. And then that thing should just disappear. If that's what we're talking about, I don't care what happens with it. Regulate it, celebrate it, give it a whole state, make it legal, encourage everyone to use it because then that's just more competition. But I don't think the price is reflecting that use case. I think the price reflects the extreme use case that this might be the only thing worth anything long term, because all the use cases people keep throwing up is what happens when your government mismanages its fiat currency? This is your escape hatch. You can sell escape hatches a lot better than you can sell occasional vacations. So that's the only problem that I have with this thing. And this is why I feel I have to pay attention until it's clear. Sandra. So, um, I'm going to just touch upon a couple points that Lee made, and then obviously, um, Kelsey, you've just made. Number one, uh, I just testified in front of the U.S. Senate Agriculture Committee hearing, and it, it's very clear. There's bipartisan support, and there's support from the industry that regulation uh, needs to come in because now this is a large enough, um, and I'm really careful saying industry because crypto currencies and the groups that are in cryptocurrencies are not a monolith. They are very different. 
They have very different characteristics and they shouldn't be lumped together as sort of one industry, but let me just leave that for now. Um, for regulation, the reality of that, I think most people get it. You're gonna get some of the fringe elements that say they don't want anything to do with government, totally understand that, but the pragmatists and the practical people in the room understand now the question is what and how do we do it? I'm gonna say another thing. We, GBBC, are not a lobbying group. We do not lobby. We try to present balanced and neutral information that is here are the pros and here are the cons. And we see the cons and we want to help get the bad actors out. How do we help make sure that people can participate in, an, in, a, in a free choice society where they can make those choices, inform choices with education and support backing all of this up and still work on mechanisms to get the bad actors out? There is absolutely alignment there. We don't sit here every day saying, oh, yes, let's just ignore the fact that there are scammers and fraudsters in the space. Unfortunately, any new tech, any new industry, any new anything that can that it seems like a gold rush, you will get bad actors. And that's where we are right now. So that's that. And then as the person who actually created the Bitcoin futures at CME Group, I will say this to you. It took us three years of development and working with the CFTC and doing a lot of background work to get that product out the door. And it was never the perfect product, but it was the product at the time, US dollar cash settled, that could actually you know, satisfy the requirements of non-susceptibility, price manipulation, and all the other things that we do when we safeguard and release a product. So even though Bitcoin might seem like this crazy volatile product set, it actually is not one of the CME's most volatile products. So I would say, you know, do some digging and make sure that uh, you take a look at all the products that CME has. Some great points, Sandra. Anthony? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave Sandra's points out there because they're so significant. I'm just going to address something that Kelsey was talking about related to money. You know, we took ourselves off the gold standard, John, in 1971. It was $35 an ounce for gold. It's $2,000 an ounce today. Uh, we, you know, you know, the simple math is we took the money down by 99%. And so if you have assets, like Kelsey was saying, you can shelter yourself because the assets will go up in the denomination of fiat currency. But if you don't have assets, you know, and you remember my dad, my dad worked in McCormick. He was a crane operator for 42 years. He was a laborer. His time and his energy gave him money. But if you're inflating away the money, then you're stealing the man's time and his energy. And so whether you like Satoshi Nakamoto or don't like Satoshi Nakamoto, the central authorities have been irresponsible with the money and they have really hurt the society. 20% of the society is disaffecting right now. We turned working class aspirational families like the one I grew up in into economically desperational ones. And we did it through the corruption of the money. And so I'm not saying Bitcoin's going to replace the dollar, Kelsey, but I'm saying that it is now an instrument that can be out there that has a finite supply. And it is a technological ledger that people can use with each other. And if Sandra's right, and I hope she is, uh, and if somebody like Kathy Wood is right at Arc Asset Management, it'll have a lot of value as it continues to scale and it gets adopted. But you guys, don't miss the elephant in the room. Read Nakamoto's white paper or the people known as Nakamoto. Uh, the point was we're corrupting the money and we're stealing from the society. And guys, inflation is a regressive tax. OK, you and I, we can shelter ourselves, perhaps, you know, Calvin Klein bought a waterfront estate in East Hampton in 1987 for three point seven million dollars. He had assets. He sold the place last summer for eighty eight million dollars. My dad can't do that. A laborer can't do that. So, you know, whether you like it or not, OK, the central authorities opened the door for innovation as it relates to currency. And by the way. OK, we got to fix this problem. This problem is not going away. It's going to get worse. These people are prone to conspiracy theory. They think there's a microchip in the vaccine. They don't like any person on this panel. OK, because you're all affiliated with some kind of establishment thing. OK, and it's nasty stuff. OK, and some of them, as as John knows, are related to me. 
Okay, they're out clamming in Oyster Bay or they're cutting deli meat or installing auto glass on Long Island. Don't like the way the society is going. And just remember that when you're thinking about all this stuff intellectually. Look, so one thing I want to respond ahead, with quickly, if I can, is I agree with you there. Like you think about the average person, they see this set of lifeboats being built. And let's say you're right, 100% correct. Well, just like the housing situation, there's not enough assets to go around, right? We have firms that will go buy out the assets just to participate in rent sinking, right? So yes, we know buying property has always been a pretty good idea based on the example you've given, but we know that large entities will go buy properties by the tens of thousands because they also know that because they have a head start in the system. So if you look at the distribution and we're just picking on Bitcoin, Sandra's point, there's lots of these chains. So which one of the 9,000 tokens do you pick? So it's not very clear that Bitcoin is the one in authority that's going to hold your value over the other 9,000 coins that are out there. So a lot of people don't know who to trust. And remember who's given the advice. These are the same people that crashed the market in 2008. These are the same people who led and built and designed the credit default swaps and all this other stuff. And now these people are saying, you should get into this new thing. It's going to protect your wealth this time. So most people have a trust issue here. And the last thing I'll say here is that when you see people building lifeboats, right, we're all on the same sinking ship. And with their amount of resources and knowledge, they said, we can't fix the ship. So we're going to build a limited set of lifeboats. All of you cannot get a lifeboat. This is true. There's only 21 million tokens. Some people own thousands of tokens already, right? Some of the tokens will never be recovered. Just picking on Bitcoin, just to be very specific. We know for a fact everyone's not getting the Bitcoin. It's not mathematically possible. So either a couple of things have to happen. Your lifeboat has to get really, 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 really big, and you'll be the only one on it because most people are not interested in taking those lifeboats and rescuing anyone else. So this is why it's really hard to get on board with this idea that everyone that's paying attention now should take some of their wealth. Remember, most of these people we're talking about don't actually have wealth to pay rent, let alone sit it in Bitcoin and wait. They need this money now. So this is where this, this whole idea just doesn't add up for the billions of people in the world, but I definitely see how it makes sense for the small few that can afford to get into this. You know, this a question came up. Wait, Lee, let me just throw this question at you and then you can answer from the audience because I haven't gotten to a lot of them. If Bitcoin is good for the unbanked, why has El Salvador's experiment failed? Nobody uses it there. Everyone just cast in their free $32 in Bitcoin for the US. Lee, or, or you make your point, Lee. I just was going to th want to throw out there because it came from the audience and I, I'm sure people have responses to that. And then we're going to have to wrap it up after that. But go ahead. For sure. Well, so you know, so I've, I've agreed with a lot of what Sandra and Anthony have said. Um, you know, there are a lot of problems with our financial system and our economy. Absolutely. Inflation is a regressive tax. Our payment system is far too slow and antiquated. And it's the poor who, who suffer the most from that. And so the, you know, the crypto sector, sorry, Sandra, but for lack of a better, better uh, uh, phrase right now, the, the sector, they frequently point out these very real problems. The issue is that they're not offering real solutions at this point. We still haven't seen the, the killer use case, you know, cross-border remittances, you know, hasn't been, hasn't been solved yet. So, and maybe it will. But right now, very clearly, it's not being solved. Now, to El Salvador, I mean, what's happening there is a humanitarian disaster. Um, and it's really sad, you know, frankly. Simply, why hasn't it taken off? Because it's far too volatile. If you're a merchant, why would you accept payment in something that can go down by 20% the very next day? So Bitcoin's volatility and cryptos in general volatility will always hinder it. Uh, from being a medium of exchange and the consequences you know for el salvador doing this are pretty dire so the rating agencies have downgraded their uh debt to you know it's already junk but it's gotten lower the imf is is threatening to cut off um funding uh to the country and as far as i can tell the only people who have benefited from this move are the president of el salvador in his, and his cronies um, so I just don't think that this is something that folks who are pro crypto should be pointing to as a success story or justification for, you know, why crypto should be worth whatever they think it's worth. What do you think, Sandra, Anthony? Go ahead, Sandra. I've taken a uh, 
wait and see. It was clearly a very bold move by a world leader to basically declare Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, I'm not at a place where I'm going to say it's a complete failure, but I think we've definitely seen issues. Um, if I were a world leader, would I do that to an uh, entire society that's depending on my leadership and my cabinet's leadership? Probably not. I would have given some thought and analysis to what the implications are. Um, but again, they've just launched this. It's only been a short while. I think we'll have to see how it works out. I, I do hear you, Lee, about the negative impact, for, especially from the international community. And it concerns me too. Um, but I'm, I'm taking more of a, let's see what evolves. Um, they've already made the decrees. It's already legal. So um, it may turn out to be not a great case study. It may turn out to be a very bold move that did end up going well, um, TBD. Okay, Anthony? Well, uh, our FBI director is basically testifying right now uh, to the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he's saying that they've identified 4,500 uh, crypto accounts that they blocked uh, from an interagency perspective uh, of Russians that are trying to avoid the sanctions. And so I know you guys think that they can't do it. And I know Lee doesn't like the Mike Morrell white paper. He thinks it was contrived by the lobbyists. But there are people in the FBI and there are people in the legal authorities that think that they can trace a lot of this stuff and they can block a lot of it. Secondarily, Princeton announced this morning uh, that they are uh, going to be using uh, cryptocurrency. They're launching an initiative on the blockchain um, and they've got a few of their well-heeled alumni obviously giving them a big gift. Um, and the process of the cryptoization of America is continuing. And, you know, you're not going to like this. Okay, but I'm going to just say this to you. Uh, the regulars did not want Uber to happen. Okay, you just go look through the origin and the history of Uber. Nobody wanted it. Well, let me tell you guys who did want it. The people wanted it. And last summer, <clears throat> excuse me, when the infrastructure bill was being put in place, there were some senators that were positive on Bitcoin and there were some senators negative or positive on crypto, negative on crypto. And they got blown up with an unrelenting amount of phone calls. And so all of you have heard of a decentralized autonomous organization. But these 63 million people are DLOs. This is a decentralized lobbying organization. And many of them are single issue voters. So I do believe that the government is aware of this. The executive order, Lee's admitted this, as has Sandra. Crypto's here to stay. So the question is, how are we going to fairly regulate it? And how are we going to come up with use cases that make sense for the people that want to use it? And I think that we're well in that direction. And billions of dollars is being invested in Web3 to make it happen. Now, Molly, again, I'm sure there's a lot of flaws. I don't know anything where there isn't a lot of flaws. There was... Web one internet fraud. Uh, there was web one things that went poorly, uh, but web one survived and uh, thrived and it made our society more productive and more efficient. And I believe the same thing will happen with web three. Kelsey, so, I'll take us home here. here is, yeah. For the people watching this, this idea that people could democratize these big institutions, including things like our financial system, that is important and noteworthy, but it only makes sense when those institutions just don't come back in, take it over and set the rules. That's the thing we have to pay attention to. So let's say one of these blockchains does rise to prominence. The thing we're gonna to have to be careful of that you should still compete with it. We're not in the business of king making. If the fees are too high on the one that we pick as the winner and that has all the licenses, then the people should demand a different technology that brings things back down to that original vision. So is this thing a scam? I think in summary, probably not. It's only a scam if we allow the people who we were trying to avoid in the first place, take it back <laughs> over and set the rules for everyone else to follow. That's the most important thing, regardless of what the price is. Lee, do you have some final thoughts? And then Sandra, and then I'll, I'll take it home because I see Bruce's face, which means that our time is just about up. We just have a few minutes left. Lee? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to follow up on Kelsey's point, the powers of centralization, it's not as if blockchain is immune 
from those. And in fact, there was a great paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research a few uh, weeks ago that looked at the Bitcoin blockchain in particular, um, and it found that the top uh, 10,000 uh, holders controlled uh, you know, something in excess of, I think, 30%, uh, you know, don't quote me on that, of the of the Bitcoin. So in many respects, the, the crypto sector, again, I apologize, Sandra, is more concentrated than the dollar system. So there's nothing inherent to these technologies that lends itself to, you know, this diffuse balance of, of power. And so I think we all have to be on guard for this, as Kelsey just pointed out. Sandra? Well, first of all, thank you all for um, having this discussion. And frankly, I think we're aligned on a number of different um, areas. It is up to us whether this thing, the technology and all the cryptocurrencies that go with it uh, are, are for the good of society or for the bad. So each of us as leaders in our given you know, sectors, we need to keep talking to each other and making this what we hopefully as a society would like it to be because you are absolutely right. There are problems, but we can solve them or get, you know, find frameworks to to to, to mitigate some of the risks. And um, it's, you know, and all in all, if we do our jobs right, it will be beneficial to society in the end. Yeah, I, I so I've really enjoyed this. You know, my my viewpoint is 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 definitely somewhat narrow. When I was chief of the Office of Internet Enforcement, I could see the benefits of the Internet so easily that it was I always felt such so privileged to be fighting internet crime and trying to clean it up so all the good could happen and in fact i wrote a lot about that when i was with the government about how government's role was to make the internet safe so good things can happen i i get that and i there's no doubt in my mind that everyone on this panel feels that way i just don't see the benefits of blockchain in front of me i don't see the benefits of crypto i just see again from where i sit how much it has enabled crime ransomware has just gotten worse more sophisticated, evolved, and Bitcoin is the killer app of ransomware, which can really devastate a group. So that that's sort of my final point. I don't think. Thank you for your unbiased moderating. Of the <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you know, you're like an unbelievable you. person, by the way. Unbelievable. Keep Let me tell way. you my one piece and of. And the teeth whitener is also working quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you my one unbiased view, I, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. All four of you are extraordinary. And if any of you ran for president, and I've, I've said this to Anthony and I've said this to Kelsey, but I mean this for Sandra and Lee, you both should be secretary of treasury under either of them. You know, if we could get well, one you, of you. In Lee, you'd never be my secretary of treasury. You're trying to shut down the whole goddamn industry. I mean, what am I going to do? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is okay. you're all incredible. Make you secretary of treasury in Russia, though. I want you to screw them up. Okay, keep going, John. All right. Well, you're incredible, Anthony. You know, I love you more than anything. And uh, all of you are, are just the, the discussion has been incredible. I, I love this kind of thing. I hope we could do it more often. There have been no sponsors. Nobody's making any money from this. We're all just providing this for people. Uh, Bruce is going to tape it um, and, uh, and, and produce it for everyone so they can see it, because I really think it's a historic event to have these kind of of brain cells together in one place and just being able to sit here and listen to it. And you're right, I'm biased, Anthony. Maybe I'm a little less so after listening to this panel because you're all so extraordinary and you say compelling things. So thank you for doing this. Uh, it, it, and you're all very busy and everything. It's just uh, so wonderful to have uh, to have worked with you on this. And thank you. And uh, Bruce, why don't you take it from here and, and wrap it up? Thank you, John. Uh, hey, that was really interesting. Uh, I think I learned a ton today. Um, thank you. So uh, quickly, if the audience could just take a moment and, and click on the uh, ratings button, provide us with any feedback you may have, we'd really appreciate it. On behalf of Securities Docket, I want to just thank everybody for tuning in today. And of course, I want to thank our guests, Kelsey Hightower, Lee Reiner, Sandra Rowe, Anthony Scaramucci and John Reed Stark for a great moderation of this discussion. Uh, the webcast a great, has been a great unbiased moderation. <laughs> great unbiased. I've been pushing it. I was like, keep it fair. Keep it fair. Oh my um, God. Webcast is the, the Fox News of moderators. <laughs> fair and balanced. Oh my God. All right. The, the, the recording will be available shortly on Security Stock. We'll also put it on 
our YouTube channel shortly. But that's a wrap for this webcast. Thank you all, and I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.